and you are live. Good evening and welcome to Taking Flight, our beginning beekeeping class. This is lesson two. I'm delighted to be here at LTV Studios and I thank Soundcraft Aviation for sponsoring this series. Thank you so, so, so much. Um, last class, we talked about setting up your site selection for your, your beehives and they did get a couple of quizzes and I haven't seen homework assignments come back where you were to give me your site plan for your beehives. And the second thing is, is that you were going to tell me about how many growing degree days were in Riverhead over the course of the last five years. What's the average number of growing degree days? And the third thing was is that you were gonna tell me what swarming means. Now, since I haven't received a whole lot of homework assignments, I'm not telling you this time, but I will promise you I will tell you with the next one. Could I have the next slide, please? This is me, this is about as good as it gets. I'm Chris Kelly, I'm a master beekeeper, and I am the owner of North Fork Promised Land Apiary. I've been keeping bees now a little over 50 years, um, and I know I don't look over 29, so that's pretty cool, right? But in that, you can, you can actually follow us on uh, uh, Facebook. We have a, a Facebook uh, page for Promised Land Apiaries, or you can even follow me on Instagram. So either that. Could I have the next one? All right, I put this up because this is truly a reminder for yours truly on it. One of the things that happens I love in the journey of beekeeping is when you start to get immersed in it, it really kind of consumes you. And I can tell you as a young boy at 10 years old, it certainly did that to me. And over a course of a few years, you start to think, I actually know it all. It's a beautiful feeling because you, you think your bees are responding to you and that you're the director of what these beehives are doing. Well. There comes a sad thing in here, and I love what Randy Oliver of Scientific Beekeeping put up here, because this chart almost follows exactly what I've done. The only thing I would say that's different, you get into this pit of disillusionment, and that's where the bees declare that they're sovereign over what you think they are. And meaning bees will, the only thing consistent about bees is they will do what they want to do when they want to do it. And so what happens is typically you have this pit of disillusionment where all of a sudden you realize you're not the master of it and you've got to change your approach and learn from the bees. And that is exactly what you do. You actually start to learn from the bees. So I, I love the idea of that plateau of enlightenment. Now being Irish, I actually have to repeat this step a few times. So I look more like a, a graph that goes up and down, up and down. So every five or six years I start to think I actually know what I'm talking about and then all of a sudden the bees put me in my place. If I could get the next one. I have to put this up because obviously today we had a little snow, a little rain, and the temperatures are really cold and I want to start thinking about spring on it. Everybody knows these are crocuses. Crocuses really bloom quite early, typically late February, early March, depending on how warm it gets. Um, but the bees get some pollen out of it, which is a nice food source. Next. All right, a couple of things, couple uh, things I'd like you to think about. For those of you that are going to be starting in on your own beehives, um, we're actually having an equipment building party on March 12th. That's a Saturday, it will be, that will be held actually on the North Fork. That's gonna be held at Halleckville Farms in the barn. We have right now about 45 people gonna be showing up. Here, the reason I'm doing this is I want you to know, understand how to put together your boxes, how to put together your frames, how to install the foundation, so you make your equipment and you make it and look right. That'll be on March 12th, about 12 o'clock we'll meet. It'd be about two hours. The next thing I want you to uh, take note of is 
we will be doing a practice installation of live bees into a live beehive um, on either April 30th or May 7th, and this is weather dependent. Has to be some nice weather um, for us to do this. If you are a bee student, I do encourage you to bring your own protective gear because there will be live bees probably more than you've ever seen in your life. I would uh, like to add, Chris, that this is pending board approval that we get another year approved for our beekeeping okay. project. For the, for the East Hampton site, um, this is pending board approval. Hopefully they'll say yes and we'll be able to keep rolling because our intent is to have the East Hampton Yard to be both a demonstration and a teaching facility. Thank you, Bernadette. You're Next. Okay. If you haven't done so already, you can go to my website. If you're going to order, uh, if you're going to order bees, you can go right to my website, and there's a, a icon that you click on, order bees here, and it takes you right through the process very quickly. If you want to order equipment, please email me at beekeeper1 at optaonline.net, and just tell me you're going to run one, two hives, 10 frame or eight frame uh, Langstroth hives, and I can do the rest for you at that point, because I'm doing a bulk order with both North Fork and South Fork beekeepers. I promise you I can get you the best price on that. All right? Next. Okay, so today what I really want to cover is two things. One is inspection of a beehive, what it takes, and the second part is a little bit about record keeping, what you, you're keeping. So I put this up here. This is a, a, a picture of a young lady in a black cocktail dress, and I, and, I, and I put this up there because about four or five years ago, I actually had a bee student a, a come to a bee yard in exactly that kind of outfit, all right? Um, that's not what you're going to wear when you get ready to look at bees. What you're going to do is the best thing for you, if you don't use a protective beekeeping suit, you can use your, your clothes, but a light colored, long sleeve shirt, long pants on it, no reds or blacks. And the reason why you don't use reds or blacks is because that is out, out of the color range spectrum that bees actually see. So when they see all black or red, it lo you look black to them. That darkness, you are a target for them. Second thing is, is you want to keep the bling in it off at home, okay? You don't want to use uh, a lot of jewelry because, again, this is one of these things the bees can see that shiny um, jewelry. But the other part is, is the perfumes or colognes. Remember that bees' principal ways of actually communicating and sensing the environment is through chemical cues. Your perf strong perfumes and colognes will actually disrupt what their, their, actually, their environment, that disruption can create some uh, headaches for you because they do get dist distracted. Once they're distracted, they then end up starting to look to sting you, okay? Other thing you want to do is avoid using open sandals or open shoes because when you take frames out of a beehive, sometimes as you take the frame out, the bees will then roll off the frame and they'll fall to the ground. And if they fall on your feet, you don't want that, that feel. So sneakers or work boots are really the best, best bet for you. The next. When to inspect your hive. And I, I like to, to do this. If the weather feels good to you, it probably feels good for your bees. And so mid-morning to mid-afternoon when the temperatures are in the, in the 60s are a little bit better, that's usually a really good I idea to do it. Um, avoid excessive humid days or <coughs> the onset of thunderstorms or heavy rain on this. Kind of interesting, honeybees are quite sensitive to the barometric pressure. And when you start to see um, your beehive have no flight in front of it, they're actually telling you some, uh, there's a storm front coming. When the barometric pressure drops, 
they will actually stop flying on that. And that's truly not a good time to go in. And I just want to, you to think about in excessive humidity. If you're really uncomfortable in excessive humidity, think about a beehive like this when it has at its peak anywhere from 40 to 50,000 bees. Guess what? You're going to see them bearding all up on top of the, the hive, on the outside of the hive. Um, and you'll, you will understand the reason they're doing that is they're trying to cool down the hive. More people will hang out. Could I have the next one? Here, if you take anything home tonight, this is the most important slide you're going to see me put up all night. Why do I go into the beehive? These are three things that I will drum into you. First and foremost, is my hive queen right? The definition of if my hive is queen right is two things. You either A, see the queen, or B, there are eggs, the presence of eggs in that, in that hive. Those two things are absolutely paramount. You check this every time that you go into a bee hive. The second thing is hive nutrition. How much pollen and how much honey is in the beehive? For the beginner, this is probably the hardest challenge for you to actually cover because what you think is a lot of honey I may not even look at it and say that's much, not much weight. Not that. The third thing is hive health, and that is the presence of disease or pests and the monitoring for a mite called Varroa destructor. All of these things are paramount to keeping your hive healthy. Now, last class we talked about monitoring growing degree days. This is where growing degree day monitoring becomes so important because insects are directly influenced by the amount of heat that is coming through through the course of the season. And you can predict some of the uh, pests and parasites that will show up based on the number of growing degree days that have showed up. Could I have the next? How often am I going to be in the beehive? This is what it's going to look like. Now, forgive me here, this is actually more for overwintering cycle. March to 15th to April 15th, when the weather is kind of unpredictable and the, the hives are in their, what we saw the start of their growth curve, you're gonna be in those hives once every 10 days around April 16th to July 4th. This is kind of the sweet spot, if you will, for where the bees are in their growth cycle, your plants are in their growth cycle and maximum yield time, and your photo period. The other driver for honeybee hives, the photo period is still increasing until June 21st. So in this time, you as the beekeeper are gonna wanna be in those hives at least once a week. From July 4th right till what we'll call Labor Day, you can go back out to every 10 days in it. This is where the hive now, the growth phase has gone from growth to decline, and it initially is in a decline. It's a rather gradual slope downward. The other thing that happens in, in this time is, is that the the hive is now not bringing in near as much honey and pollen as it had early in the season. September 2nd to October 1st is from the beekeeper calendar is critical because this is where you are doing as a beekeeper, you're actually setting up the frames within the beehive to be positioned correctly for the winter months to come. From October 2nd to, the, to really almost the, the 15th of November, this is the final call, so to speak, of when the, the fall flowers are coming to an end. If you've needed to feed your bees in the fall, this would be a time that you get your last bit in for them. And I put this in from mid-November right up until pretty much mid-March, but you, that's 
you can float that two weeks either way. Um, no frame inspections. That means when you open this beehive, you're only looking down in to see that your bees are alive. You're not breaking frames out of the, the hive. This is a really important thing here. Inspection time. Every time you go into a beehive, it should be no more than seven minutes per hive. Now, the, there's a reason for this. When you were initially, as a beginning beekeeper, go in, there's no way you're going to do those three things in seven minutes. So what I'm going to encourage you to do is take out your iPhone or your Android or something and put a stopwatch on it just to get into the discipline in those first few inspections when you have your bees in, <coughs> in April to July because I want you to get into the discipline of the seven minutes. You're not going to make it the first few times. Don't sweat that because in that sweet spot of April 16th to July 4th, the bees are actually quite kind. They're quite kind because they're in the growth cycle. They're quite kind because they also have plenty of food. But in the back side of the season, or the next portion after July 4th, guess what happens? The honey flow goes down, food source goes away, and they're a little bit like you and I. When we don't have a lot of food, we get a little grumpy, and guess what? Bees get grumpy. But if you have this discipline of seven minutes, you're able to identify three things. Am I queen right? What's my hive nutrition look like? And do I have pests? If you can do that, if you get that discipline, you're much, much less likely in the back half of the season to, you're less likely to get stung. And the second part, and probably most important, every time you get after seven minutes, every minute after that is the equivalent of disrupting the hive's entire uh, homeostasis by about two hours. So I want you to think about that, all right? So you get in there, and sometimes I tell people, it's kind of like when my wife has a yen to changing where the furniture is in the, uh, in the living room at 11 o'clock at night. And then I come home, and I end up tripping over a chair that I didn't realize was there. Everything's all messed up for me, OK? So the, the idea is, is you do want to be timely with the way you are in and out of the beehive. If I could have the next one, please. OK. As beekeepers, you almost you have to understand the life cycle of your bees. And in, honeybees are insects, and all insects have four stages. They have the eggs, the larvae, pupae, and the adult. In the uh, pupae stage, that's where you're going to see there's a silk capping that goes over it. It's where it goes from the ugly grub to the adult on it. If I could have the next one. Here, in this particular one, this is something you as the beekeeper actually need to memorize and truly learn. <coughs> in the caste system of the honeybees, there are three different um, things. We've got the worker, we've got the drone, and we've got the queen. The workers, are the ones that do everything that relate to the functioning of the beehive. They are the ones that go foraging. They are the ones that go and sting you if they, if they guard the, the hive. They are the comb builders. They attend to the queen. And it, they go from egg to adult in 21 days. The, dr the drones, who are the only males in the hive, they go from egg to a, adult in 24. So it's kind of typical male. We're a little bit behind the eight ball most of the time, OK? And then you have the queen, which is, who is the only fertile female in the entire hive. And she goes from egg to adult in about 14 to 16 days. The difference, the reason for the difference between the queen getting out in 14 to 16 days and a worker in 21 is the diet. On the, on the workers, they actually only feed royal jelly for the first three days of that bee's life. Then they switch it over to what we call a bee bread, which is pollen and nectar. 
with the queen, she gets royal jelly throughout the entire larval period. That difference is what speeds up everything there. If I could have the next one. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this one in this particular class, but we are going to do an entire class on pests and predators and diseases of honeybees, at which point you, you do, hopefully I don't uh, depress you too badly in the, in the process. Um, because it's important to understand this Varroa destructor um, does today influence almost every decision that we make as beekeepers in our management plan. So to understand the life cycle of your honeybee and to understand the life cycle of Varroa destructor is actually almost paramount important for you to be able to get through um, beekeeping and keeping your bees successfully and healthy on it. If I could have the next one. Okay. When we talk about honey hive inspections, part of what we're talking about is what we call brood quality. When I talk about brood, brood is the, the first three stages of the, the honeybee's life, the egg, the larvae, or the pupae. Sealed or capped brood should look light, light to chocolate brown. The caps should be convex and complete and no holes, no perforations. Larvae should look creamy white, and eggs should be one cell, uh, one egg per cell, slightly off center. If I could have the next one. This is what a balance of, of um, sealed brood, you note on the two slides, or, or the two pictures, the difference in coloration, all right? Different co coloration, light chocolate brown to dark chocolate, almost. But you see how they're convex, they're whole, they're intact on it. Another thing I'd like to just point out on these two different frames, in, in, in my looking and evaluating of a beehive, <coughs> I would first note this brood, okay? But the second thing I would note is on the one on, on my right, uh, or on the left there, is you take a look at the chalky material there. That's pollen, okay? You see it's a nice band of pollen. And on the one where the guy in the blue shirt is holding the frame and you see that white sealed capping, that white sealed capping is actually ripe honey. Now, as a beekeeper, when you're looking at that, you now have been able to evaluate two things. You're able to look at the quality of that brood, but you're also starting to look at how much, how much food stores do I have in that beehive. Could I have the next? The presence of eggs. This is what you as a beekeeper really need to be able to see. If you need to use a magnifying glass to help you to, uh, see the eggs at the bottom of those cells, really important that you do that because this is your confirmation when you see a single egg like that in a cell or slightly off center. This is the kind of thing that says to you, I have a queen even though I can't see her. Next, next, please. All right. You're rarely going to see your queen, but if you do see her, um, you want to actually evaluate her appearance. And the first way that I like to do it, I like to watch how she walks along the comb. And the reason I do that is what I want to see, that all six of her legs are functioning properly. The second thing I do is I look and on her thorax, which is the center segment of her body, all right? I look at it and I say, do I see hair or pubescence around there? And you see here, this is nice and dull as opposed to this bright, shiny dome here. Because if there's no hair there, it gives you an indicator she's an older queen. The other part that will tell you that, you see how tightly her wings are. In back behind her, she's got them literally overlap. As she gets older, her wings will start to slide outward, and sometimes the very edges or the margins will start to get tattered. But this is a nice young queen. But the final thing that you look at, the abdomen, the last portion of her body, 
you see how distended and literally in, almost swollen it is. This lets you know that she's been well mated and she's, she's quite vigorous on that. Next, please. All right. If you see something like this where you see multiple eggs in a cell, most beginning beekeepers use the phone number 1-800-CALL-CHRIS. No, I just, I'm just telling you. But the, the reality is that this is really a very serious uh, condition for the beehive. It may be one of two things. One is a laying worker or two, a failing queen. This is initiated because the queen in the hive has something called a queen pheromone. Let's talk, let's just make it simple and say it's like the perfume of mama. When that goes down at a certain level, the hive actually gets in distress. And that distress sometimes will initiate one of these sterile worker bees the ability to be able to lay eggs into, into these cells. They never lay one egg. They end up laying multiple eggs. Um, the second part is, is if Queenie herself is starting to fail her, and that pheromone is down, sometimes she was not well mated and then lays what we call drone, drone eggs only. Okay, next. Okay. Hive nutrition, it varies with the season. So you're gonna, we're gonna go through some of our record keeping, but hive nutrition, balance of the honey and the pollen with, within the hive is going to change with spring, summer, and fall. In, typically in the spring, we have the lowest reserves of honey and pollen. If you wanna think about it, a beehive that has just come through winter has been eating its reserves all winter. So it's now at its lowest point. In the fall, going into winter, you absolutely need to have the opposite. That's where you want the maximum amount of honey, maximum amount of pollen for them to be able to survive the winter. The placement and positioning of pollen and honey stores are critical for the hive's ability to overwinter. Can I have the next? All right, so this is what a honey frame looks like. You see the white cappings. It's a white beeswax capping. When you see it capped over, that's what they call ripe honey. It has a moisture content of 18% or less. And um, this kind of honey that is capped over is actually viable literally for years. In fact, they found some, some honey in the uh, tombs in Egypt that was still actually viable, okay? But the comb on the right there is the pollen, and you see pollen comes in all different colors. The entire spectrum of color from white to black and every color in between. Is it, what you see that's really interesting here is they never completely fill the cell with pollen. They usually only fill it between a half to two-thirds full. And when it's ready for, um, for the winter time, they actually glaze over the very top of that pollen with a very thin layer of honey. And what that does is it creates a, a bee bread that the bees will be able to use through the winter months. If I could have the next one. I just want to give you in general here <coughs> with beehives here on Long Island, in general, our highest quality pollen is in the, in the spring and early summer. By the time we get to August 1st, we may have a very large quantity of pollen still coming in, but its actual quality that comes in drops. What that means is the protein content in the pollen drops. And that's kind of, I like to use the equivalent of in the spring, we got filet mignon, and in August, I got a McDonald's Big Mac, okay? They're both called beef, but I think we'd all agree that they're a little bit of a different quality. Um, the other thing, too, is that honey flows around here are effectively over by July 4th. And um, what that means is, is that 
your actual food source of honey drops dramatically. We have had a couple of pluses in that there's an invasive species called Japanese knotweed. And Japanese knotweed um, blooms late August into early, almost early October. And in some areas now, it's become quite a nice honey flow for the bees. It's great with honey, I mean great honey source, and a, and a good pollen source. Um, but I want to caution here, the extended falls that we've been seeing can seriously compromise your honeybee's ability to overwinter just due to the idea the warmer it is, just think they actually eat more food at that time. I have a question. How long is this? Is this the golden rod? Because that's what we had here at the airport yard in vast majority the, the, in the, the fall. The gold, the gold, the golden rod here is actually, actually a very high quality um, one, but it typically, it's not a really large source of, of honey here. It used to be uh, it, quite a large source, but the actual pollen is awesome and the actual honey is excellent too. All right. We have a next one, please. All right, here, I just wanted to put these out here because this is, this is just an example of two frames of honey that are what we call mediums. That's not the big deep ones. There's the mediums. If I could get the next one. Right? This is what a full deep of honey, this is the 10 frame size uh, deeps. And if you take a look on the bottom and the top of the box that's right next to it, is that you can actually see the beeswax capping. If you look in between the frames, you can actually see the white cappings actually coming out. That box there that's, that's leaning up weighed out at 76 pounds. It's a significant amount of weight in there. The other thing here that I like to look at when you split a box like that, you can actually look down in between all those combs and see whether you have bees filling out each of those, those frames. Could I have the next one, please? So what does this look like to you? Because this is going to be new to you in all its glory. I'd like to put this out as uh, when bees are rearing brood, what it takes to rear a, a one egg to an adult takes one cell of honey and one cell of pollen to rear that from egg to adult. And a hive will consume, think about this, a hive will consume the equivalent of 700 pounds of nectar in the course of the entire year. Now, that's nectar, that's not, that's not honey. That, that comes down to about 300 pounds of honey. When bees gather nectar from the flowers, it's basically 50 to 70% water and 30 to 50% sugar. And what happens is the bees evaporate that down, and that's how you come down from 700 pounds of nectar down into 300 pounds of honey. Now, between 60 and 80 pounds of that honey, you as the beekeeper will need to leave on that hive for them to survive through the winter. What did that look like? That looked like that slide before where that one big deep was absolutely chock-a-block full of honey like that. I like to put this so you can see it simpler. You saw the earlier slide, the one slide of a full deep frame of honey. That weighs about six to eight pounds on it. So a 10 frame will be easily 80 pounds of honey or more if it's, if it's full. And um, a medium frame, which we showed on that other one, it's about half that, about three to five pounds of, of honey per frame. And I do this so that this way, when you, the beekeeper, are in your hive, you have a reference point to say how many frames of nectar, how many frame, or eight frames of honey, and how many frames of pollen do I have? And you, could, you can say, okay, I saw three, and I, you told me three frames of deeps of honey. I got 18 to 24 pounds. That's a, a nice way to think about it. I'll tell you, I'll guarantee you how you'll know you have a lot of weight is when you try to break it 
break this apart, and you say, oh my God, I can barely lift it. Not it, not it. We have the next one. Okay. Before I get into the record keeping, I actually want to take a moment and just kind of slide, slide through what does it look like for me, the beekeeper, to do an inspection in a, in a, in a beehive? The tools of the trade are right here. You have a hive tool, and in here, this is my smoker. And in this smoker, I would have this filled with either burlap, uh, straw, pine needles, anything that's nice and burnable, just don't burn synthetics in here. I would have this smoker going well, because these are my two tools. The smoke, we like to say calms the bees. I tend to say it calms the beekeeper, and then somehow we get through with the bees. But the, this is, these are the tools that you are definitely going to need for working your bees. The other thing about it, as a beekeeper, I want you to use all your senses. So when you get to a beehive, first and foremost, always try to stay to the side of the beehive so that you allow the bees unfettered flight coming into and out of the hive. Then as I like to use my sight. And what I do is I look at the bees' flight, and I like to use two words. One is, is it purposeful? Which means they're flying in and out like JFK Airport. Or B, is it lazy? Why is that important to you as a beekeeper? It's going to tell you a story of if they're busy, it means A, they probably have really good food source. B, they are probably queen right because they have to feed those baby bees that mama keeps laying eggs for. If it's lazy, it may be an indicator that A, your food source is slowed up, and B, you may have a problem with your queen. Second thing that I like to do when I watch that flight is I like to watch the bees actually land. Because when they land, some of those bees will be carrying pollen. And I like to determine, I like to make an estimate. Is one in 10 bees bringing pollen? Is three in 10 bees bringing pollen? Some kind of broad range. And what that tells me, when I see pollen, pollen is an indicator that brood is being reared. So now I can say, I've got pollen coming in. I probably have a queen in this hive, and I haven't even gone in yet. The next thing I like to do is I like to sense the smell. A beehive should smell like a bouquet of flowers. It should smell good, OK? Off smells in a beehive before you even get in it are an indicator maybe I have a little bit of trouble on it. So the, the, the pollen will be on the back leg of the bees. It's actually very easy to determine because the bees, they literally uh, make a big ball on the very backs of their, uh, on the mid part of their back leg. And when they land, because it, it's kind of cumbersome for them, they land, they kind of have to stop and slow down um, on it. I like to keep when my record keeping, I actually like to keep the record of when I first see pollen coming in. And the other thing that I like to do is I like to say what direction are the bees flying in. And what it does, it helps me understand where they're getting their food source from at the same time. So then what we've done here now is me, the beekeeper, I've actually done all of that before I ever got into this beehive. Now, my goal in this beehive is three things. I'm going to see the queen right, the nutrition level, and what kind of pests and, and predators, or pests and parasites are in here. All right? As a beekeeper, what I like to do, I like to start from one side or the other. I have absolutely no bias. As the beekeeper, you're going to actually smoke gently across the entrance. Literally go across the whole width. Make sure. One of the things I've seen with beekeepers is they kind of use their smoker and they make it like incense. That's, that doesn't work. That doesn't go in the beehive. But if you smoke directionally into the beehive, 
then you can effectively fill that hive up with a little bit of smoke. Then what I like to do is I will crack this lid. This is your outer cover. And I do a gentle puff across this hole that's in the inner cover. This hole there that's in the inner cover. When I've done that, what I've done is I've actually now covered here, and I've covered my main entrances. And what the reason, part of that reason is, is the guards are typically at the very entrances of that. Now, I like to then take this outer cover, and I like to lay it upside down and behind the beehive. This way, I've got completely uninhibited or unfettered access to the beehive. I then like to, when I use a hive tool, when I pry something apart, I use the straight edge of the, of the hive tool. So I will just pry this up and can take this inner cover right off. And then I like to just put it with a slight angle to the, to the uh, outer cover. This way I can start stacking without it all kind of sticking together. Then what I'm looking at is I'm looking at the top, top box here, and I take a look at all, all the frames. And what I like to do is I will look down into this, this hive before I've ever taken a frame out, and I'll count the number of frames I have bees filling out, OK? And then once I get a handle on that, if I'm going to remove a frame, what I have to do often is use the curved part to loosen frames, OK? Once I've loosened that frame like that, I can then go back to my straight edge, and right near the edge of the, or the end of the frame, I can pry it upward. Once I've done that, I can then pick up both of them. And I like to say, when you take a frame out, always look at the side closest to you first. And the other thing I like to do, I like to find where the sun is. And then I like to have it so that the sun is over, look over my back. So I can put this frame in full sunlight. This becomes really, really helpful for you when you're trying to look for eggs. You have the sun beating down and look, giving you the brightest light into the bottoms of those cells. Now, typically, the way a beehive works is the uppermost boxes will have mostly honey. And you will be looking more towards brew, OK? So for the purposes of today, I'm just going to go ahead and take the medium supers off and really focus here on just the brood chamber on it. When I'm in this brood chamber, everything remains the same. I like to, like to have my smoker between my legs, just like this. And you can just kind of crimp down on it with the inside of my thighs on the bellows. This way I don't burn myself on the actual smoker itself. I just keep it here. And then the gauge that I use for how do, how do I know when to add smoke, right? Well, what I like to do is I watch on the in-between. The bees will be in these spaces here. What will happen is their heads will come upward. And when you see a lineup of bees' heads at you, then what you would do is you would gently just do one, maybe two puffs of smoke, direct it downward towards those, those heads. And what will happen is it will invert. It, what you'll see is nothing but their abdomens at that point in time. All right? So as I get into this hive now, remember, your time is seven minutes. You don't need to go through every frame because you can, you can actually make a determination for A, how much honey, B, are your queen right, and three, whether you have any pests. We could have looked through these two boxes already in terms of saying, do we have any weight to them? If they're empty, you, you say, guess what? There's nothing there. You're good. You go down. But say we got to that second box and you felt a difference in weight. And that difference in weight is telling you, 
you have a bit of honey going on there. So you put that down. But when I get into the brood box, and I'm going to start taking frames out, I like to free either the absolute end frame or the second from the end, and I take this frame on out. I will take a quick look at it. Again, I'm looking under the sun. And I will look and evaluate on this frame, do I see brood, which is eggs, larvae, or pupae? Or do I, all I see is liquid gold, which is honey? Or do I see chalkiness? OK? Then once I've got this frame, I like to put it on its ear and stand it against the, against the hive stand. This way, I now have space. I have created a space between frames. This is important because one of the things that happens with most beginning beekeepers is how they kill their queen is they roll her, meaning that they had the frames too tight together. And then when they picked it up, you saw how big Queenie is. Well, she's not real, really, really mobile. And they roll the queen. And it's, it's crazy. It doesn't seem like much of an action, but if she rolls, she will die. OK? So I like to create that room. And then when I pick up a frame, I like to hold it with my thumb and my index finger. That's it. This, is how, this is how easy it is to hold it. So when I want to look at the side towards me, I put all my fingers here. And then I can look at this frame. You don't have to lay it down straight. I like to have it at a bit of an angle. And again, that's because I have, usually have the sun with the brightest, you know, behind my back that way. Now, when you want to look at the other side, all I like to do is I literally drop my fingers and turn her upside down. In this, you can actually go through three or four frames, and you will have a very good idea at this point in time, because the weight of the frame is going to tell you one story. The brood pattern is going to tell you another story. And the sight of the queen will tell you a story. The third thing is, is when you are looking in the beehive, if it, if it shows you that um, you don't see any, any discoloration in the brood. You don't see any beetles walking around in the beehive. You don't actually identify or see any mites. You can actually start to say to yourself, I think I look pretty good. And I've taken way longer in all of this discussion than it would take you to do those assessments for your beehive. So when we look at this record keeping, here, I just wanted to do, use an example of a hive that I did in April. And what happened, what I write down here, in your record keeping, look, there's a, there are hive apps. There's all sorts of things. For a small number of hives, I just recommend, man, just get yourself a notebook. Get yourself a notebook. I think the most key thing is understand the date that you're going to do that. I like to. This is an actual frame inspection, but I think what really has some more value to you is exactly to notate down when you, you first came there. You might want to do some weather thing, you know, say, hey, it was about 70 degrees. But I like to say pollen sighted, yes. Color, orange, flight direction, south, southwest. OK, those are the kind of things I like to do because here's the thing. Over the course of overlap of years, what you're going to see is that every year, I can tell you when the goldenrod honey flow starts at my house, the bees turn and go due east, right to a field of 70 acres. And it, it, it's like clockwork. I know that happened. The second thing is, is now you see I wrote down queen right. I didn't see the queen that particular time that I saw her. OK? Frames of brood. Now, this is what I'm going to tell you. When I take out a frame, I, I, I have to work in whole numbers. I can't work in partial numbers, OK? If I see eggs, larvae, 
and cap brood on one side, I'll call that one frame. Because I'm not going to say, oh, it's a half a frame. This, no, it doesn't work for me. I just might, right. But in that hive, I saw four frames of brood. The other thing that it says there is I saw three, three frames of pollen and honey on it. Might count. In this early part of the spring, that was a visual. Visual meaning that I was checking the actual adult bees. I actually checked the bottom board here just to see if I could see mites along this board here. Because the mites are easily and readily visible. They're a, a deep red in color. Um, and once you've seen them, you'll never forget them. Okay? The other thing is I look at the adult bees. The adult bees, again, you're looking to see, am I seeing any deformities, any abnormalities in, in the bees? If I don't see that, and I don't see this perforated cappings in the, in the sealed brood, if I didn't see any of that, I feel pretty comfortable. Now, note, I say I feel comfortable. It's early spring. Now, you see here, I put bees covering eight frames. That means in this box here, out of the 10, they were covering eight of them. Okay, I saw bees going on all of them. When that happens for me in the springtime, my rule of thumb is what I call the 70% rule. 70% rule is when the bees cover more than seven out of the 10 frames, in the springtime, now mind you, I'm following that growth curve of as the bees are growing, I'm going to add boxes. So what I did with this one is it says action step taken, I added a second deep. For the purposes of tonight, I'm just going to say I added a super, just like this, all right? And then that, that gives me an idea of where, where I'm at with this one. If I could have the next one, please. OK, this is two months later. This is in June. This was right at the maximum honey flow. The heaviest honey flow that hits out here on the east end is anywhere from about June 5th to June 25th. When it comes in, in it will last anywhere from two to three weeks, depending upon heat and the amount of moisture that's in the soil in it. In this case, I actually found the queen, OK? Did an evaluation. I did a simple thing. I said, she looks good, which means there was no obvious defects to her. Note what happened here now. In two months' time now, you now ha I have what I call 10 plus frames of brood. That means an entire box or more was full of, of young eggs, larvae, and pupae. That tells you this hive is on the ascent in terms of uh, population growth. To give you an idea, in an average frame like this, you'll have over a 1,000 bees if there's an awful lot of bees on the horizon. And in this case, that's great. It's great for the so the other thing that you want to see there is I now I have six, six frames of Hey guys, we have to pause for a second. Your mic is uh falling, we're having a quick thing. Matt, go out there and You good? Good now. No. No. Hold up. Matt, go back out there. Matt, go back out there.
All right. In three, two. So we see now we had five, uh, six frames of, of pollen and honey. So we've doubled the volume of honey and pollen that we have in the hive. And we doubled, more than doubled the amount of brood in it. This hive is in that explosive growth phase. Now, my mite counts. Now I do something quite a bit differently here. Is I actually, you formally monitor for them. And I use something called an alcohol uh, wash, uh, where we end up taking 300 bees, which is about a half a cup, dump them into a rubbing alcohol, swirl it around, and by doing so, you actually separate the mites from the bees. What I found was two per hundred, which is right around just below where you want to be treating for the bees. But you notice here, I have the bees are now covering two deeps and into their first honey super. So the action step I took here, add another super, and I make the note, I will treat these bees for Varroa post honey flow on that. If I could get the next one up. So this is what it looks like a month later now. The main honey flow is over. Um, and what you start to see is I saw the presence of eggs, but I saw no queen. Note that the number of frames of brood just came down slightly. This is a natural progression that I should see. Um, I like to actually see that slight uh, decline. If I don't see it, what it says to me is queen did not get the message that she should be slowing down a bit. And the reason that's important to me as the beekeeper is remember, the greater the amount of brood, the more mouths you have to feed. So the bees could actually easily use up that extra honey that they put in by used up into rearing brood. But in this case, what you see is a slight drop in the brood. You also see an increase in the volume of pollen and honey in these, in these frames. And I'm almost, when I have nine frames of pollen and honey in my, what I call into these brood chambers, I'm actually starting to feel good because going into winter, I need a total of about 12 frames uh, of honey and pollen. But note here, now the, the mite load has actually gone up. It's now to three per hundred. That's where you need to be able to treat for them. And um, what I would reference you here is the Honey Bee Health Coalition has a wonderful, wonderful um, conversation on what materials to treat with, how much to treat for. Um, we are going to cover that in the fourth class of here. We're going to actually talk about this quite a bit. Um, but note here, the bees are now covering two deeps and into the second super. Um, but my action step here is I removed the honey that I wanted to harvest from this hive, and then I did treat these guys with a oxalic acid as per scientific beekeeping uh, protocol. I will, I will be honest with you, you, you can't actually use this particular treatment anymore in New York State in the summertime, okay? You can use it in, at different times. Um, but that's kind of the overview for you of what it looks like to be doing some bee inspections. One last note I'd like to, to take up with you is one of the beekeeping books I really enjoy is this beekeeper's handbook, all right? It's a very nice comprehensive guide that I think will give you a, a real hands-on, a nice reference to be able to look at it and say, hey, what am I seeing, and is it normal, is it not normal on that one? So I strongly recommend this book to you. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Yes, yes sir. Um, I wasn't here for the first class, and I don't know whether you're going to cover it, but it seems like this is, this is inspection for bees that you already have. I'm going to get my first set, uh, case of bees this spring so what's the sequence of events after the 
I mean, I obviously I have to introduce the bees into that. Do I just leave, I have two deep and one medium. So am I just leaving them a, a, a deep until I see that that's going pretty well and then I'm gonna put another deep on? Okay, okay. Let, me, let, me, let me come, come to, to it. it. Yeah. The inspection protocol is the same whether you're overwintered or whether you first start. But when you first start, I don't know if you're buying a five frame nuke or whether you're buying a package. Pack, a, package. a package. Okay, so, but here, sir, you ask a great question, but here's what's going to happen for you. After you've installed your bees, this all stays true. How many frames are they covering? Okay, so when you look at yours, let's just say you get them April 15th, you put your bees in, and you, you what I would suggest to you, you're going to start with a single box. You're also going to probably feed them some sugar syrup, okay? Um, and if you start right in the spring like that, you're going to make a one-to-one, -one, which is one cup of sugar, one cup of water. You're going to probably feed them about a gallon a week. Um, and what, what you're going to do here, though, is, again, everything we spoke about stays true. So say you, your hive, you had... Um, you installed April 15th. Do you remember the earlier slide that said well, how many days from egg to adult for a worker? Uh, worker says 14, 21. 21. Now this is why that, and this is, you did great because this is, this is why it's so important. Your package started April 15th. When would the first newbies Hatch out. 21 days after. 21 days after. So, so you're into, into the first, the first week, week of May. Of May. Right. So, so you, you know, know in, in this one that you actually have no physical growth in this hive for three weeks. Right. Okay? Right. So, so in, in that, that, after three weeks, by the way, with your, your package, after you've installed it, you're going you're gonna to look at it a week after. And the key that you're going to be looking at there, your big one there is do I have eggs? Because if you don't have eggs, you've got a hive that's in real trouble, okay, um, on that one. Everybody else, in terms of your nutrition level, you know you're going to have next to nothing because you started them with nothing, okay? The idea that they're going to come with pests, they are always certified by inspector, inspectors, so they, you can pretty much rest easy there that you're probably in good shape. Yeah. But coming from you on, on yours there, after I got after three weeks, I now want to see that I'm starting to look at that measurable growth of bees across these frames, okay? Um, and that there, when I talk to you about that, that 70% rule remains the same. Because one of the things that most people uh, underestimate is how rapidly and how explosive that growth is in those first couple of months. And that's what you as the beekeeper have to be um, uh, aware of, okay? And in starter hives, with, I'm assuming you've got all new equipment and everything. Right. So you really, you're starting at the neatest and the neatest and the cleanest and the cleanest. That's really, really good, okay? Because that's going to be really definable. For you, there's going to be a little bit some different things that may happen. For example, say you tried to start your bees in the center and they slid over to one side, okay? You as the beekeeper may end up moving their frames and say you took out these two empties and slid these guys over into the center and move those frames. The reason you're doing that is now you're going to allow them to expand. You, you, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. On, on that. So thank you, sir, for that question. Yeah. Back to another question. You said yeah, I'm sure. going to feed them a gallon of syrup a, a, a week. Where am I putting that syrup on inside the... Okay. I like something called, and we actually did this in the, the last class, but, uh, but it's not a problem, okay? There's something called the top... There's something called the top feeder, okay? 
The feeder is not quite the same size as this box. It's a little bit shallower. But what it has, it it's actually usually has a plastic insert. And there's a place for the bees that they can actually crawl up a channel and feed and get access to the liquid. Okay? So I I like the the I like the top feeder because it literally fits the entire dimensions of the hive. The access for the bees is quite close. The gallon means that you're not going to be there trying to feed them every day. Okay? Uh, I, think I think so, so sir. sir. Um, and the particular one I like is out of Man Lake Bee Supplies, their top feeder. And then, again, if you're doing a 10 or an 8 frame, same, which is perfect, you know. Um, on a, you could get the eight frame size, it's easy. And you'll see it's easy, it's easy to clean, it's easy to do all that. And I'm sorry, I don't know whether you have this, but I, I like to ask a lot of questions. Um, and where am I putting the water? I have the, the syrup, theater, right? And, is that, and then I need water. But understand, the syrup is one, one thing. thing. Right. Okay. okay, the syrup is, is one, one part, part sugar, sugar one, part. one part water, and that's going to go in your top feeder. Your fresh water source has to be within about 30 yards of your beehive. And um, bird baths work real well. Shallow bird baths work very well. Um, remember, the key there um, is to make sure you have a place for the bees to land. Whether you put plants in there, put, put rocks. Actually, something that I got taught is to make almost a volcano of sand in the middle of a bird bath. And so what it does, it creates an island, again. You know, on but that is, that is definitely in the first, um, yeah, yeah. So no, no, it's all good. It's, it, it's all good, so you can go ahead and reference that. And you, you can look at each of these lessons on that. Yeah? Thank you. No, you're welcome. Any Good other question. questions? Uh, I have some questions from the uh, email. Just give me a second. OK, so I have one. I have, all right, so I have a question from Bob over in Cyclonic. What's the average life expectancy of a hive? Well, well th there's twofold to that now, OK? The average life expectancy of a hive that's well managed can easily exceed five to 10 years, OK, if well managed. And what do I mean by that? Um, you must be able to control the uh, pest level of Varroa destructor. That's the mite that fundamentally changed beekeeping completely. Unchecked, Baroa will kill your hive in about two years. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. All right, um, I well, got one, one second, more. One second, Jason. And would that be the same queen for the five to 10 years? No. 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 But the thing is, is with that, um, when you're talking about if the, if the hives last five to 10 years, they will naturally replace her, probably once every two years. And sometimes she'll last even longer than that. And the hive would have a problem adapting to the new queen? No. 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 Remember, bees have been at this a lot longer than you and I have been. So they've got this kind of dialed in on it. Okay, another uh, question from Bill from Springs. How do bees differ based on what continent they are found on? How do bees differ based upon what continent <coughs> they're, they're found on? I think um, probably the better way to look at that is, is what is the weather like where they're found? So for example, in Europe mo and some parts of, of Asia and um, North America, what you find is you have kind of this variable temperate climate, climate that actually has four distinct seasons of a spring, summer, fall, and winter. And that creates a different kind of environment for the bees to work. If you end up in kind of that Mediterranean climate, more in Africa, Central uh, America kind of thing, you end up with a temperate to tropical climate in there, and the bees actually react quite a bit differently. What does that look like? 
to you as a, uh, as a beekeeper, the actual hives can be quite a bit different. In, the, in, the, in our North American climate, what we can use is these column type beehives, all right? So they're, they're vertical. And the reason for that is because we take advantage of the way bees actually keep their hives, where they, they separate their brood from their honey. And in that separation, it's typically in a vertical column. Because when the weather gets cold, the bees form this cluster. And that cluster is what keeps all of them warm. But when they go to eat the honey through the reserves through the winter, they actually move up vertically. When you're in warmer climates or in even tropical climates, you have no issue with the bees being able to move. That loss of that kind of movement, in other words, in tropics, they can always go laterally, they can go vertically. Whereas in, in the cool climate, what happens is, you have to understand, bees are cold-blooded. So if you have freezing temperatures, they can only move very small increments at once. Whereas the tropical, it doesn't matter. So you oftentimes in Kenya, you'll get the log hives. Um, there's it, been a big movement for something called the top bar hive, which again is a, a modern variation on a, on a hollow log. And the bees have no issue traveling laterally there. But the moment you get into cool climate, you have to be aware of the um, fact that the bees will cluster. And the bees typically move in a vertical motion all the time, not lateral. Uh, and then our last question is from was it Sam in Montauk. Have you ever tasted honey wine? Where can somebody buy it? How is it made? I guess that's more of three questions in one, but honey wine, what's your take? Well, I got to tell the story that the guy that taught me beekeeping, he actually was a great mead maker, okay? And actually, mead was actually the wine of the Vikings, okay? So they've been making mead for thousands of years. Really, really kind of a, 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 a cool a beverage in that mead, it, it follows the same principles as just grapes or any other kind of thing. How you make wine is you take the sugar product that you've got, add yeast, and in the case with honey, you actually have to dilute it so that the yeast can actually eat that sugar. Um, in terms of mead, in terms of availability in, in things, it's actually long been considered a niche market, meaning it's not a big, uh, it's a specialty wine. It's not a, it's not a broad spectrum wine. That being said, uh, a fine mead is just like a fine wine. All right. Cool. That's our uh, stuff from online. Thank you very much. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And thanks for having me. Any, any other questions? We, we good? You good, sir? Yeah, for now. <laughs> yeah, for now. Well, you have my email, and don't hesitate. You know, you can certainly send a list on that. But I do suggest it, get this book. All right, cool. Uh,